chapter 5. Do you love the book of Romans? How many of you are excited about the direction our church has been going in the last 30 years? <laughs> Nothing happens overnight. You know, the things that we've been saying and speaking and standing for, it's been going on for a long time. And, you know, there's something to longevity and faithfulness and continuing with the vision and just doing what God has called you to do, especially in the times where it seems like nothing's happening. We just sang about it this morning. We're not moved by what we feel or see, but we stand on God's word when it comes to these things. But it's pretty cool to see things start happening too. Amen? You know, isn't it good that you get to be part of it? Imagine right now that you're living in this narrow window of time and God created you for this purpose to be here now to experience his glory in this end times move that's happening. Isn't it amazing that you're actually able to be part of that? Amen? Whether you know it or not, you know. But um, I, I was really stirred up and thinking about this. I think there's something inside me and I think is inside every man uh, and ladies too. Uh, we're called to be protectors. You know, even talking about that security this morning, how we protect our families and our mates. And, you know, there's no doubt there's no man in this place who would not lay down his life for his family and his spouse. And, you know, there's something in us that want to protect. God's very protective of us. Amen. He's a good father. And so... I was really stirred up about this message uh, by Scott Hicks, of all people. <laughs> that guy can hear God, you know? Psh, man. I'm saying that facetiously. Of course he can hear God. He's a great man of God. But we were meeting in Dr., with Dr. Tan in Pastor Dave's office, and it was after uh, services one night. You know, it's a little bonus for the worship team and for those. Not everybody can go in, but, you know, they work so hard that... I get to sit with the man of God and ask some questions, you know, and it's really a cool time to get to sit, sit with these men of God and just ask them some very direct questions. And Scott had the question of the night and uh, it's something I'm usually try to be really, you know, aware of. And that is when we have something like this happening, how do we protect it? Because we don't want it to end. And, you know, sadly, there's been so many revivals throughout history where God has moved and they've not ended because God desired them to. Usually men got in the way, you know, either you try to control it, you know, how many of you know you can't control fire, you know, it just burns where it should. And I'm not saying that, you know, sometimes you don't have some wildfire, you know, when you have revival type meetings, but there's an old saying, I'd rather have a little wildfire than no fire at all, you know. So what happens is we get intimidated and, and you start getting your eyes on those things and worried about what people think and it just quenches what God is doing. So part of us is we have to be careful that in, in the move of the Spirit, whatever direction God is moving during these services when we gather together, that we don't put the brakes on. Because really, it's us that determines that. God's a gentleman. The Holy Spirit is going to come where he's welcome, and he's going to move where there's freedom. And as long as we stay free and in a place of freedom, he has an atmosphere to move. So I thought it was a great question and just super wisdom that Scott brought that up and said, you know, basically, now that we have this, like, how do we protect it? How do we not quench it? What do we do? Uh, which is something all of us should be asking ourselves. Amen? Now, I know that either, now there's most of you walking more wisdom than I do, but I ask myself that same question. Like, I want to make sure that I'm in a place where I'm encouraging the Spirit of God to move in freedom, not discouraging Him. And thank God we're a church where we do have that atmosphere. We really do. You know, we're learning, and just like anybody, we've got a long way to go. But we move in freedom in this ministry. We really have a desire for that. Thank God that we have pastors that lead us that way. Amen? Where the Spirit of God is just free to move as He wills. And when we have that kind of atmosphere, He's going to move. And He's going to have His will accomplished. Amen? But, you know, the other side of it is, as far as our personal responsibility, you know, we, as the body of Christ, and I, and I try to make a habit of this, and I've done it for years, on my way to church, because normally I'm by myself in my vehicle coming here, you know, to get set up and get ready. Every Sunday, I prepare my heart before I get to this place. You know, and I, I mean, I try to stay in a place of preparation, but especially Sunday mornings, and, and especially if I'm going to be up here in this pulpit, you know. Father, I just lay myself before you, not in my truck, I can't do it, but you know, <laughs> the idea of it, you know, I don't lay down, I lay, you know. But, but I just, I submit myself completely to you whatever you desire, like, here we go again, Jesus, I need you. Whatever you want, I'm yours. 
I pray for all of you. Father, I thank you that the people are going to come in with a heart ready to receive and just flow with what you're doing in this ministry. Pray for you. Pray for me. And prepare my heart and get ready for whatever God has for me that day. If we would stay that, in that place as the body of Christ, we're always going to get something. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care where I'm at, what kind of church I'm going to, I'm taking something home. There might be a whole lot I don't, and maybe I'll leave some things there. <laughs> But I'm getting something because I know that's dependent on me because I have to go in and be ready to receive, amen? So that should be our heart every time that we come together, and I know that you do that. If, if you didn't, we wouldn't have what we have. But here's what happens. Inevitably, and I'm, I'm going to be very careful when I preface this, you know, it's inevitable that when you start to have this momentum, there's going to be things that come along and try to steal it. And it's, it's amazing. And I, when I say be careful, this is what I mean. Because I've heard people say, well, I just know I'm walking around with a big old target on my back. <laughs> well, not me, buddy. Like, I, you know, I'm sorry, but you can wear that target if you'd like. I'm taking the target off. Right. You know, and, 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 and I understand the principle. There, there is a principle of where you can make yourself a target, yes, but I'm not going to be creating myself to be a target either. You know, so we just watch out for all those little open doors like, eh, no, 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 I don't think I'm going to see it that way. But I am going to be as wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Amen? So we should be wise to these things. And, and what does happen a lot of times, let's say I'll use the worship team for an example. I didn't have this plan, but they've been around worship ministry for, you know, a couple of years. Because <laughs> we're very young. <laughs> Talking about the Hickses, you know. And so it's, it, it is an area where the enemy really likes to attack, and especially when you get some momentum and, you know, you start having some, if you want to call it success and God's moving, and then, God, you know, you're all starting to gel together. You know, it's an area the enemy really likes to hit because he knows that if he can do that, it's like, you know, attacking the family. He's going to start a lot of times with the husband, so he knows he can get the husband. It can implode the whole family. And then the wife is maybe there trying to hold everything together. And so it's an area where we have to be really sensitive to the Holy Spirit and leading, and especially as you start to get these accolades and God's moving and you're up here being exposed all the time and, the, you know, people are, you know, telling you how wonderful you are. You just have to be on guard and keep your heart in a good place. Well, even in your own personal life, whenever you come to somewhere you're serving and it's like God starts moving, it's just like the enemy to try to throw things at you to get you out of God's presence and the move of God that's happening. You know, he'll put things in your way or situations or circumstances will come up. I'm going to tell you right now, like, I, and, and I thank God, this is not against anybody who's not here. There's people that just can't be here today. But in, in my estimation, with what God's doing and the, the availability of his presence that's here that we have, it's not a pride thing to say, I truly believe like we should be packing out an auditorium for people to come in and experience God's presence. Now, timing is everything, and I know that there are seasons of that, and growth will come, but I just think, my gosh, like the things that are, you know, the freedom that we're experiencing here, I just want everybody to experience it. And then there's people that should be here that have probably been knocked out of their walk, or really they're supposed to be here at Faith Alive, and for whatever circumstances or reasons, they're not. So how do I protect myself? I can't think that I'm exempt just because I'm a staff member, and I've, you know, this is my home church. Because, you know, there's plenty of opportunities to be disappointed, disillusioned, be offended every day. You just have to reject them. It really is a choice to walk in peace, love, victory, all those things. If God has made them available and he does not hold them back and he gives all these good gifts to his children, not just, he gives them liberally, like anything that you want, it's yours, you have access to heaven, then the only really drawback is the way that I see it and how I receive it. And so this is where it becomes even more critical as the Spirit of God's moving for you not to just protect the ministry, but you to protect yourself. And when you recognize things, you, you say, oh, no, no, I can see what's going on here. That's not happening. Amen? So that's kind of what I'm leading into. And there's a few things I'd like to share with you just about God's nature. And it, it, listen, it's not going to be anything you haven't heard before, but it's just an encouragement and a reminder. So when you recognize those things when they come, you need to be utterly convinced of God's provision for everything that you need in this season that we're in. Amen? I, was, I, I find like, um, you know, the, 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 like quantum physics 
and, and math problems, even though I really am terrible at math. But there's just certain things that are fascinating, especially when you can't wrap your human mind around them. Um, you know, and even with quantum physics, like they call it the God realm. There's things that just even break uh, the laws of natural science that are just really, uh, Einstein called it spooky science, you know. There's some things that happen that are just unexplainable, and that's why I really believe it is kind of the God realm. There's been some great books written on it, actually the spiritual connection to it, if you're interested in things like that. But even with math, and I think I mentioned this a while back, you know, the, the fact that numbers are infinite, like how do you, you could never count high enough. Numbers are infinite. They don't end. There's no end to them, at least in our understanding. And the universe is still expanding. It's an infinite universe, yet God holds it all in his hand. So, you know, this, one of this, and, and again, for those math majors in here, correct me after the service, not right now. Praise the Lord. <laughs> But, you know, with, with numbers that are infinite, even if you subtract something from that, it doesn't decrease it, right? I mean, like, if, if numbers go on forever and as much as you subtract from it and because they continue to go on, it actually doesn't increase it. And that's a God thing. We serve an infinite God. And, and there's plenty of evidence in Scripture that he is infinite in his ways that he's made provision to you. Amen? So... Whatever you need in this life, he has made provision for in everything. I had a conversation with a pastor friend of ours. Uh, I, I can say who it is. It wasn't a private conversation. Pastor Tim Oates, who's the associate pastor at, uh, at Spiritfield Church, um, they're launching out and planting a church in Idaho. And they've already got this amazing building and like God is moving and he's just, and they, they don't have a, you know, a built-in body that they're stepping into. They're going to outreach and grow that church. And I just love Adventures of Faith, man. I'm so excited for him and what he's doing. Um, but we were having this conversation, and, um, you know, and not that he was, like, struggling with, where well, are we going to get the money, this, the Catholic church that we're buying, and it's a beautiful building. Like, you know, uh, they might be asking, you know, one hundred and fifty or $250,000 down, and I'm hoping it's going to be fifty. And I just kind of said, like, well, how much money do you have in the bank? Well, none. What does it matter if it's 50,000 or if it's a quarter million? Like, I mean, it's just a simple math problem. Like, if I have zero and God's the provider, whether it's 50 or if it's 250, what's the difference? Because to him, he's still going to have to provide. But for us, like, those numbers sound so big. Well, huh. well like, do you have 50,000? Well, no. Well, let's believe for 50,000 if that's where you're at, you know. But even if it's 250, it's going to have to be provided. You don't have it anyway. You know, I'm not saying by faith, I understand the principle like, well, I have it in Jesus' name. Yes, I'm, I'm with you on that. But literally the money wasn't in the bank. And so until it manifested, like the literal manifestation of it had not happened yet. So it almost don't matter what the amount is because God's got to provide it anyway. Why not just believe for the bigger number? Well, it worked out where they only had to come up with 50,000 and it was fine, you know, and they, they're, you know, going to sign papers soon. So it's exciting. But the fact is God has got a provision and no matter what, he's got your back. Yeah. If he said it, you know, with the old saying, like with every word that God has spoken is all the provision that's needed to fulfill that, that task. So if he said it, he's going to provide it. It never comes the way you think it will. I can't tell you in ministry how many times like things have come and it was just totally out of, you want to call it left field, like we didn't expect it that way, but God moved and provided it anyway. Amen. All we have to do is stand and believe. So you got to come to a place where we all do where we see God as bigger, infinitely bigger than any needs or problems or anything that pops up in life. Because this is what happens, you know, in this season that we're in and what we're doing, God's moving and all of a sudden something happens. You get a diagnosis, you, you know, are bankrupt or something, you know, family members start fighting or there's something going on in your life and it tries to take you out of the plan of God for your life. In that moment, if you're convinced that God is going to provide anything you need to surmount that problem, then it's not an issue any longer. That doesn't mean you still don't have to work through it, but I'm really convinced that people, when they get to that place where something happens, if it knocks them out of that place, to me, it just seems like maybe God was not big enough because he had the answer for it for sure. Do you see where I'm coming from? So we need to rehearse these things and always go back to God's provision in his nature and how much he loves us. And he has everything that we need in this life. Anything that pertains to life godliness is ours. So 
2 Corinthians 6, 18, this is one of the verses. Don't, you don't have to turn there. Stay in Romans 5 because I'm going to throw a lot of verses at you today, but the boys are going to put them on the board. It says this, but will, God, um, but will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles, not Corinthians. 2 Chronicles 6, 18. But will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house have, that I've built. I love the message Bible says this. The cosmos itself isn't large enough to give you breathing room. So that is the God we serve. And this is why we need to rehearse these things and always remember that God is bigger than anything that's going to come at you. Amen? There was a VeggieTales song that was, God is bigger than the boogeyman. You remember that? The <laughs> bigger than, you know, or the monsters on TV. You know, so... That, that wisdom was free this morning. Go watch VeggieTales, you know, if you have not recently. Amen. But just a few things. And so when it comes to eternal life, and this thing that God has given is called eternal life, that actually began the moment that you said yes to Jesus. You know, it doesn't happen after you take your last breath on this earth. It began the moment that your spirit man was recreated. Because this is just training ground we're on right now. And you will, you know, unless Jesus tarries, uh, um, I mean, if he does, Terry, there will come a day when you'll breathe your last breath on this earth and you'll go on to glory. And either way, you win, right? I mean, it's not like it's a losing day. And long life to you, whether it's 120 years or whatever you desire, God bless you. But, you know, we live in this temple made with hands, even though your spirit man is eternally recreated and it's going to be together with the Father forever. Amen? We're going to get a new body. Thank God for that. But eternal life, and look here in Romans chapter 5, I want to look at this a little closer. We're just going to read the first five, five verses right now. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Say, thank God for peace. Thank God for peace. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Don't you love that part? Uh. <laughs> Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, looking at verse 2 here a little bit closer, the word stand there, and this is why we always encourage you to, you know, to go dig deeper, to really become a Berean, become a student of the word, because that's just going to help you in your fight, because it is a fight of faith. There are some things that you have to fight through sometimes. It just doesn't come to you. Amen. There's some things you have to stand on the word. You've got to fight the good fight of faith. Of course, we received them by faith, but how many of you know sometimes a manifestation takes some time? You know, you still deal with all these outward things in life. The word stand there literally means this. One who in the midst of the fight holds his position. It's like a boxer, Brother Bob. I, I, I've never boxed, but I know you better hold your feet in the right way. You better keep your guard up. Like there's some things when you're holding your position in a fight, you don't want to be just the guy who's, you know, not knowing what's going on because you're going to get clocked, you know. So we, we really fight as believers from more of a defensive position, you know, protecting what God has already given us. I'm sure you've heard that before. You know, there are, we are offensive in our faith sometimes and go and take the land. But even in that statement, it's like God has already given us everywhere that our foot treads. So most of the time we are in a defensive position. So we recognize things that come. And you're like, whoa, hold on. Uh-uh, not in my house. Amen? That's the protector on the inside of us. So we fight from a defensive position, and it is a fight sometimes. But standing is one who in the midst of the fight holds his position. That's the Greek definition. That's literally what that word means, to stand. Glory, you know, and I've, I remember reading a book when I first got born again. I think his name was Merlin Carruthers, and it was called Power and Praise. Wonderful book, a little bit wrong on its premise. Because he said, you know, you're supposed to thank God for everything, which sounds right. But even like, you know, the principle of, well, Lord, I thank you that I was in prison for 30 years and I have cancer. <laughs> it was all really based on one little misinterpretation. And especially in this passage, it says give God glory in everything, not for everything. So we give God glory in everything. That means in the midst of the fight, in the midst of the circumstance, what do you do? Oh, Father, I give you glory right now. It just brings the atmosphere in. But it's not like, you know, I'm so glad that God gave me cancer. You know? 
And, and there's people who say that. That is a very common, you know, thinking in the body of Christ, unfortunately. So we glory, you know, we give God glory in the midst of the fight. Amen. Because what does it do? It opens up the heavens and you recognize that there's something and someone who's bigger than you. And all of a sudden you're connected heavenly and it opens up that realm. The windows of heaven are open over you. And, you know, from his position, you know, you ever been up an airplane and looked at all the stuff on the ground? And gosh, it looks so tiny. You can see those pivots on all the farms across America. The mountains look small. Well, you get up in the God perspective and all of a sudden all those problems that you have and all those things that may be trying to come against you look very small in his presence. So that's why we give God glory in everything and why it's mentioned in that same verse. Amen. How about patience in verse four? Ooh. Ooh, shut up, Baba. <laughs> patience is not a virtue. It is a manifestation of the fruit of the spirit that you can exercise. And just like any muscle, it has to be exercised for it to grow and to be, become stronger. You know, the old joke, like, don't pray for patience because every idiot in the world will come along and test it. <laughs> and you wonder why you're not patient anymore and, you know, it's just getting tested all the time. Well, don't ask because you're going to get a test. Amen. So patience is this, and I love, there's several different definitions there, but it means the characteristic of a man who is unswerved from his deliberate purpose and to his faith by even the greatest trials and sufferings. Let me say it again. The characteristic of a man who is unswerved from his deliberate purpose and his faith by even the greatest trials and sufferings. So things are going to come against you, but we're not swerved and we're not going to get out of our lane whenever we're moving in something like we're moving in right now. We're going to exercise patience, amen? Second thing is this, and I've only got like three little points, in a, three points in a poem that I'm going to go through and then we're going to close, but that's still going to be probably around 12 o'clock, so don't get too excited, amen? <laughs> Second thing is this, the reality of the glory of God, the glory of God, because glory is mentioned in this word as well. <clears throat> We've been taught well, you know, about what the glory is. It can represent many things, the, the weight, the heaviness, the kabod. You know, it could mean actual wealth. You know, there's a lot of different definitions for it, but I found one that I really like. And this is still, we're still in verse uh, one and two. And it's this, God's glory is all that God is for us in his greatness and excellence. Glory is all that God is for us in his greatness and his excellence. So what does that mean? Well, the glory of God manifests in anything that you need in life, amen? amen. Whether it's presence, whether it's provision, whether it's healing and the manifestation of his spirit, whatever it is, it's everything that he is for us in his greatness and his excellence. Because he's greater than you. Sometimes, you know, we try to figure things out and you just can't do it. You don't know where it's coming from, but you just have to stand in faith and know that you have it, even if it hasn't manifested yet. But whatever is in his greatness is already on its way to you. Because he's already made provision, amen? He already had a plan. He wasn't shook. He wasn't surprised from the beginning whenever you had a need. And he's already made a way where there seems to be no way. So whatever that looks like and whatever you need, provision's been made for you, amen? That's the glory of God. That includes his manifest presence when he's moving in our midst. That includes bringing in anything that you need, the finances, the people, the resources, the material to make things happen. Amen? It's all been provided. It's all part of his greatness. Amen? Romans 9.23 says this, to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy. Ephesians 1.18, Paul's prayer to us, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Philippians 4.19, God will supply all, what? Your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So it's not based on earthly riches. And that's why, like even my point earlier, if you've got to believe God for 50000 or a quarter million, what does it matter? It's his riches anyway. I, I mean, I understand, like, those numbers and those things can be intimidating. You know, a headache doesn't seem as intimidating as cancer. But in the big picture, is it any more intimidating than God? The provision that was made on the cross for our healing, is it any different if, if there's some terminal disease that's been assigned to you or whether it's a hangnail? 
like in the big picture, is it any more difficult for God? No, because in his greatness and the excellence of who he is, it's nothing. So the in-between is how we see it and our, our ability to receive. Amen? That's why we need to see him correctly in the right way. In the greatness of his excellence, it seems like nothing. But if you're trying to figure it out on your own, it seems pretty heavy. When somebody's saying, you know, Bob Culver, we have to cut into your head with a knife and like dig around in there and fix a few things, it can be a little intimidating. But his testimony never changed, never wavered. When you walk into a hospital room and you see one of your friends that you've known for 20 years laying on a bed that looks dead because of a breathing issue, and I walk in and go on the inside thinking, this does not look good. Well, that's true. It don't look good. But because Letitia had a testimony and, and she put her shield of faith out there and all those words and, and prayers and everything that she had ever put out into the atmosphere was already working on her behalf in front of her. She's sitting on the right side over here of me today. Amen in me. So again, those things can look intimidating. And I know that everyone probably in this place has a testimony of that. Think about Scott's life or the things the Hickses have been through. All of you have been through some things, but here you sit today. Amen? So we can't get shook. That's actually the subtitle. I thought about titling my message, Don't Get Shook. Some people don't know what that means, Tish. You know what I'm saying? Don't be shook up. Don't be shook up. Don't get shook. All right. So God's glory. Come into the understanding that God's glory, it's, it's a God-sized treasure. Amen? The things that you have access to. If... if <laughs> It would be like you, your ability to receive that, like you're a thimble. You know what a thimble is? Not many people, you know, use thimbles anymore. If you sew, you know, a thimble's not very big, right? I mean, it, yeah, it protects your thumb. But trying to fit the Pacific Ocean in a thimble. The capacity to receive is not enough for the amount that's coming in. So we have these thimble size, you know, drawing on the things of God and think we've done something. And the reality is, it's like you're trying to empty the Pacific Ocean, multiple Pacific Oceans with a thimble. You could spend the rest of your life trying to do it, and it's not going to happen. So really, it's all based on your capacity to receive and the way that you see. If all you see is, you know, you're a thimble that's trying to draw water out of a glass, it might take you a good 30 minutes, but you're going to empty that glass pretty fast. But if you, ever, if you just see how as this endless ocean of grace then there's never a lack of anything that you can draw on. And your little thimble is not going to affect the ocean very much. Multiple oceans. And because he's infinite, it never decreases anyway. Amen. So it really is dependent on how we see God. And these things that we go through, because I know there's probably, there's got to be, there's some of you that are going through some things right now. It's very present in your life. But just know that the supply that you get to draw on is way bigger than anything that you're going through at this moment. Amen? And, and it's accessible. He's made it accessible to you because he chose to make a covenant with you and call you his own. And the amazing thing about the nature of God is he said, I'll take all your junk, all your shortcomings, all your sin, give me that, and I'll give you what I got. <sighs> give me your garbage. I'll take that from you. And I'm going to give you everything that I have. There's an even exchange. That's well, not an even exchange. There's an exchange that happened. There's an exchange that happened. And it was totally unfair on your part. Amen? But God chose to do it anyway. And he gave you access when that veil was ripped in the temple that day. And he said, come on in. Anything that you want, anything that you need is accessible. Now, listen, the natural realm is, you know, it's real, but it's not as real as a supernatural realm. You're going to face circumstances. You're going to look at things, especially when it's you or your own family. It hits close to home where you think, man, Lord, you know, this is pretty heavy. But it doesn't change him. Amen? It doesn't change him. So what we have to do is change our thinking and keep our heart in a good place. Amen? Infinite reality of God's glory. The depths of grace. There's no shores. There's no bottom. You know, when you think about ocean... What's the deepest part of the ocean in, in, the, in the earth? Does anybody know? I know it's a few miles down, right? I mean, it's deep. Yeah, but at some point, you're going to hit bottom. 
the depths of God's grace, there's no bottom. You can dive as deep as you want, and you're going to keep diving. There's no shores. You don't swim one day and think, ooh, I finally exhausted it and found the shore. It's endless. Amen? There's even songs written about it. Amen? Aren't you glad for that? Yeah. Praise the Lord. A God-sized treasure will not, cannot run out, can't spend it down. You think you run out, you know, well, Lord, you know, I just feel bad. I've, uh, I've drawn on it so much. This is what do you mean? It's still advancing. It's still going forward. Amen? All right, well, we got to talk about grace. This is the third thing. I was trying to see what time it was. It's only 11.20? Man, we got all kinds of time. Praise the Lord. <laughs> the infinite reality of God's grace. In Romans chapter 5, jump down to verse 20 and 21 now. Still in chapter 5. We're going to camp here for a little bit. Now, he just went through and talked about Jesus, our substitute, the life of Christ in us, and uh, the verse, law versus grace. And he wraps this up at the end of the chapter by saying this, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you've ever looked at this, anytime you see the word abound in Scripture, it, it literally means to superabound. It's beyond your reason, reason and, and ability to really understand or grasp how big it is. Where, where sin abounded, grace superabounded. So even now, anything that you run into in life, your shortcomings and the mistakes that you make, that's why the blood was enough. There's enough grace for you in your life for the rest of your life and anything that you will ever do. And that's why it becomes easier. See, when we're grace people, and we understand that more grace is not going to make you sin more. It actually draws you closer to Jesus. That's when the grace message comes in the right perspective. Amen? I'm just, I'm, I'm blown away by people that attack this message. And, and listen, you can't convince them unless they really get a revelation of it in their own heart because they're probably law keepers in their life and they feel like they have to do their part in order to please God when he's done it all. Amen? We're no longer law keepers. The, the Bible is very clear. You go read all through Romans and the book of Galatians. It literally says we're no longer under law, but under grace. Amen. The, grace is Jesus and more of Jesus is not going to make you sin. It's going to keep you from it. And the crazy thing is, and I know you've been taught this before, the more you focus on the thing that you're trying to avoid, the more that you fall into that pit. So grace frees you from sin. It doesn't call, drive you to sin. We understand what licentiousness is, but that's not what we're talking about. Amen? So, Romans chapter 5, and verse 20, let's read it again. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. It's super abounded. It means this, all sufficient, much more overabounding. So every time you read where the word abound is in Scripture, or if somebody ever comes to you and like says, well, I don't know about this new grace message thing, and say, well, are you talking about the all-sufficient, much more overabounding grace message? Yeah. Is that the one you're talking about? The superabounding grace message, is it that one? Is that the one? Because that's a literal definition of what any time you read grace in Scripture. Amen. It's more than enough. Romans 5 begins and ends with two realities. The beginning is the glory of God, and it ends with the grace of God. Isn't that amazing? that his glory came to earth and it manifested in grace and now you have this favor that's on you and everything that you do and access to everything that he has because he's shown you his divine favor. Everything that you need in this life, God has given you access to. What an amazing thing that he would choose to do that for you. And see, we, we really need to personalize it. You know, he did it for Lynette. He did it for Lynette. He didn't do it for everybody. He did it for Lynette. But he also did it for John. Yeah, amen. He did it for Henry. If it would have been one person, he still would have done it. But he did it for all of us. So anything that you're going through right now, if you are in the midst of a trial or something coming against you, don't be shook. Don't be surprised. We live in a fallen world. There's probably some of your brethren who may be going through some things too. But there has been provision made for you to stay in your lane, stay connected to the body of Christ, and there is a way out. There is a, the other side. Amen? 
It's there waiting on you, provision. But listen, you have to go after it. You do. Say, it, don't, it don't just fall in your lap. I'm telling you right now, it don't. The aim of all creation, history, and redemption is about the triumphant grace of God, freeing us from all sin, guilt, and condemnation because of his great love for us. That was the end of really what God desired so that you could walk in what you're walking in today. Yeah, heaven's a great reward. Praise God. I mean, we're going to spend eternity together. My cabin's probably going to be next to Brother Bob's because I really like him and we have great conversations, just so you know. My cabin. Did you catch that? I, we were, I think I was talking to Pastor Randy about that this week. We were talking about just God and his nature and and there's an old gospel song like, well, just give me a little cabin in the glory, corner of glory, and I'll be happy. I don't even know how it goes, but it's so far beyond our own thinking, uh, the things that he has prepared for us, amen? Like the old Keith Green song, if it took him six days to create the earth, and he's been working on heaven for 2,000 years, I don't know, man. It's going to be a pretty glorious place, amen? So I'll take my cabin any day, you know, and my cabin's going to be this glorious mansion, praise the Lord. All right, so Jeremiah 31, 3. This is, I, I love this. It says, the Lord has appeared of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And this is Old Testament. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Praise, praise you, Father. Think about that. Everlasting love, it never changes, the love of the Father for you. Amen? I love the, the message Bible says this. Expect love, love, and more love. <laughs> Isn't that good? Yeah. Hallelujah. All right, so we're on the close, but the close is a whole page, just so you know. We got through page one. So I'm telling you, it's probably going to be about 12 o'clock. I got a long close today. So there's not three of them, but it is a long one. Amen? So when, it, when we talk about the capacity to receive and for you doing your part, this is the thing I think people get confused sometimes because, you know, we know that we're not saved by works, but works are something that we need and should do. And there is work to really take hold of these things sometimes. Amen? They're not just going to fall in your lap. It's for people that go after them. There's something about zealousness that's real. The zeal of God has consumed me. It burns in my soul. Amen? So zealots are going to receive these things. The definition of zealot is a person who is fanatical and uncompromising in pursuit of their ideas or beliefs. A person who is fanatical and uncompromising in pursuit of those things. Amen? They don't come easy, uh, but they are given easy. Did you catch that? They don't come easy, but they are given easy. They are available, but you still have to go after them. Matthew eleven twelve. 12. It says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. I remember when I first got saved, this verse would trip me up, and I didn't understand it, because you just think about it in basic you know, are you saying I got to be violent? Like, I don't get it. But look at a couple of different translations here. Put the next one up. The Phillips translation says this. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been taken by storm and eager men who are forcing their way into it. Wow. Isn't that good? Yeah. Look at it again. What's this? Oh, go back. Sorry. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been taken by storm and eager men are forcing their way into it. It's people that are going to go after it. What does the uh, Passion Translation say? I know a few of you have this translation out there. From the moment John stepped onto the scene until now, the realm of heaven's kingdom is bursting forth and passionate people have taken hold of its power. So it's the passionate and the zealots that are going to take hold of the things that we're talking about. If, if you aren't walking in some of the things that we're discussing today, and, and maybe you have at times, like I said, and this, again, this is one of the things I really wanted to kind of lean towards in, in this message and where we're going to finish up is there is a process to the promise. It really is. Yeah. That doesn't mean the promise has not been made available. It's yours. It's your covenant with God. It's no question in him. He's given it to you. But we live in a fallen world. You have to exercise your faith and there is a process in the promise. Amen. We receive it by faith. We believe it now. That's not a cop-out. But the fact is, is that how many of you are still sometimes, you know, maybe something was spoken to you 20 years ago, and you're still standing on the word and believing God that it's going to come to pass. Anybody in that place right now? Amen. 
I'm convinced like I've never had been before. Even with this move of God, people that have been around this ministry long enough, which are quite a few of you, we've had the same confession for 25, 30 years in this place. And standing, I remember talking to our department heads 20 years ago. This move of God, you know, that's, that, that we're coming into, same conversation, yet even just now we're in a season where we're seeing it like we never have before. So we stay consistent in the process. Uh, Nate and I have been working together, like I said, all this past week, and we've been iron sharpens iron, you know, been building off each other's fellowship and around the word as we're working up in the, the hot, stinky attic. And poor guy, he's used to getting up a little later in the morning. I'm up at 4 a.m. So I'm texting him at 6, like, I'm on my way. And he's probably like, you know, okay, I'm ready. Never complain once. I want you to know, you know, great man of God right there. But, it, but in talking about this and, and, and really the process of things and how to receive things and, um, you know, it's like the guy, the proverbial guy who swam halfway across the lake. He got tired, so he swam back. I mean, how many of us have done that, you know? It's like Winston Churchill, I think, that said, if you're going through hell, what do you do? You keep going. You keep going, amen? We continue to fight the good fight. And so don't give up, church. Keep fighting. Keep pushing. You just, and you know, I know in your spirit you received it, but there is a process sometimes in the promise when you see the actual manifestation of what you're standing for. Don't you love instant healings? Man, they're wonderful. But there's also... There's also a process sometimes. There's also a process sometimes. I just couldn't tell. I'm... The first Sunday, Brother Bob got up and preached. And, and being in the hospital, and we're standing and fighting with him, and, you know, because this man's been dear to us. He treated me like a son, and my wife and I both since we've been at Faith to Life. I, you know, to lose him would be like losing a father figure in my life. And he's been wonderful to me. His wife was the same way. And that first Sunday that he got up in the pulpit and started testifying, there, there's the promise, but there's also a process. But there's living testimonies this morning of God's faithfulness to his promise. Amen? And it's all based on our capacity to receive. But thank God for a history that was there of putting the word out before you and receiving things by faith and that's where we're going to finish up and talking about this thing that happens and what it looks like and what's going on whenever we're walking through some things, whenever you've been through some things and they're receiving the promise on the other side. Amen. God's faithful to his word. He's never lied once. And he is bound to his word. He chose to be. So that's why we can trust it and stand on it. Even when we're going through things, when things don't look good, when things seem like they might have gotten worse when we stand on the word of God and have to trust him so that we see the manifestation of those things in our life and our families, amen? But he's faithful to his word. He's never let me down once, amen? I, I really have trained myself not to look. If, if anything happens to me or my family or something's going on, the only time I look that way is when I'm looking to the promise. I never look that way for blame. I'm not saying I haven't been in that position before where I wondered or maybe wanted to do some accusing like those old men of God, God! You know, I think about the boldness of that, screaming at heaven and shaking your fist. I'm like, man, I don't think I, I'm not that guy. Like, I'd rather shake it at Randy. Randy, you know. <laughs> I don't know, shake it at him. But I understand, like, you know, to have that kind of relationship is a beautiful thing. But it's never him. He's not the problem. Amen. It's something that's in this realm or it's your head, your capacity to, the thimble capacity to receive. There's something that's going on that needs to be diagnosed, amen? Hopefully by the end of the service, you're gonna have a bucket. You know, some of you I know have like tankers and you just empty on God. You know, these ladies on the front row that are in like prayer all the time, they're like super tankers. <laughs> you know, amen. All right, so Hebrews 12, 28 and 29, it says this. Wherefore we receiving, everybody say receiving, a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. I want to encourage you for time's sake, you know, and I know you've read it before, go read all of chapter 12. We want to keep it in context. 
But, because throughout that entire chapter, we'd have to read the whole thing, because every sentence in every verse begins, for, therefore, whereby, and you got to go all the way back to verse one. That's why we attempted to do that in the pulpit all the time. Like, well, let's back up. No, well, let's go here, because it all ties together. So I encourage you to go read it in context. But, but look at this. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. Now, hey, if you just look at that on the outset, sounds good, have grace, you know. But the word there literally means this, to possess, to lay hold of, to have ready, and to keep in store. That means there's a process there, this grace life, that you're building up some reserves. You're building up some things. You're not, you know, letting your guard down and not doing anything in the times where there seems like there's nothing happening. But if anything, you're going at it even more in the times where there seems like there's nothing going on. And then when it does manifest, you don't back off. You keep going at it. You know, it's like the principle of those who are great athletes. Michael Jordan was known for going and shooting baskets after a win or a loss. And I've never been a great athlete, but I, can, but I understand the principles behind the fact that the ones that are great, there is talent as a part of it, but there's a zealousness in them going after it for the ones who really are great. So if you want great things in your life, there really is a price to pay. Even with the things of God, you can't just sit back. There might be a divine providential move where he just pours it out on you because he's that good and merciful. But there's some people in this room that could tell you about what it means to go after it like, the, like nothing you could imagine. There's, I can't count the days that I saw Lisa Besso down here praying when nobody knew she was here. I'd be up in the sound booth working away and she's down here praying in the Holy Ghost days and months, a couple years on end, every day, coming in, nobody's here but us. And, and she's not the only one. There's many of you in here that have that kind of discipline in your life. But what is that? It's a zealousness. The zeal of God has consumed me. And I had those conversations with her. I know there was days maybe you didn't feel like being down here. And she's so gracious. She'd say, well, you know, no, it's okay. It's all good. But there had to be days where she was like, okay, today I have to go. And then there's days she wanted to go. And probably most days where I want to go. But there had to be some have to go days, you know. And you never regret being there. Like I've never regretted once going to church. But I've had to drag myself there a few times. And then by the end, you think, man, I'm so glad I came today. But maybe when you wake up in the morning, you're rubbing that old sleep out your eye, you know, and thinking about getting out of bed and Sunday morning just felt real good, you know, to be laying there with your cup of coffee. Well, got to get up and go, you know. So there are those times, but it's the zealous who are going to get the reward. Amen. First John 4, 8. 1 John 4, 8 says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God gives us the ability to win against all odds. God never fails. Love never fails because God is love. Amen? So in all the midst of this, and I always have to come back to the love of God because one of the things that we have to get a revelation of when it comes to the bigness, and we talked about that, the provision, is God's absolute if you want to call it just radical, fanatical love for you. How many of you are parents in this room? Kids. Especially when your kids were little. How many of you would do anything for that child? Still to this day. If they get older, they kind of get to be knuckleheads, you know, and you got to push back a little bit and let them grow up. And why would you look at your daughter, Mike? <laughs> they actually looked at each other. I just happened to catch it, you know. Nicole and Mike looked at each other. Yeah. Do you call her knucklehead sometimes that way? Yeah, is that what it is? A little bit. We're all knuckleheads at times, you know. So there is that time of maturing that all of us have to kind of get out there and you have to be hands off to let people grow, you know. It's unnatural if you didn't. Um, but understanding that it is not even a consideration that a father or especially mama bear would just instantly do anything to protect her child because of the great love that they have for them. And to know that your Father in Heaven loves you even beyond that, you can't even understand the, and fathom the depth and the height and the breadth of His love, you can experience it, but it's still, it's infinite. There's no shores in that love. There's no bottom to that love. 
as much as you could experience it, what's so great about being in the kingdom of God is it's so fresh all the time because you can constantly discover another new layer of God's love for you. Amen? So coming back to love and understanding that he did all this because of his great love for you that he's made provision, that's one of the things we need to focus on like never before and why we need to share it in this body for one another. Amen? So in all that real encouraging talk, what if you do fail? How many of you ever failed before? Come on, man. Yeah. It does happen, but we're not going to focus on it. But it does happen, so what do we do? 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen or the eternal. So, you know, even if you had to check out of this world, as a believer, guess what? You still win. Amen. Amen. I think about saints that have been in this church, and it has been few and far between of people that have just gone home to be with Jesus. You know, Miss Mary is a good example. Ultimately, she won. And she fought that fight and stayed around way longer than really most people would have. You know, and she fought the good fight of faith and kept her testimony and, and, and really saw victories. But I'm going to tell you what, her going home was a reward. It wasn't a failure. Amen? So no matter what, in the end, we win. Amen? And even in your failures and things that you might have tripped up and stumbled along the way, there's redemption for those moments too. And if we're honest with ourselves, we'll probably see that somewhere along the way, the thing that caused us to really stumble and fall, it was never God. Because he's always made a way where there seems to be no way. Amen? So if that does happen. But, you know, why did I title this message The Refiner's Fire? Well, where we're going to kind of close at, 1142, we're still doing all right. This is Now we're in the middle of my close. All right? So I didn't lie to you. I told you it was going to be around 12 o'clock. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. You can turn there. We should, we're going to spend a moment here. They're going to put it up on the board if you don't have your Bible with you. Verse 3 through 7 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, again, super abundant, overreaching, overflowing, more than enough, amen, aren't you grateful for that mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, perishes, through it, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the first time I've used this illustration. Many of you have heard it other places before. But the idea behind the refiner's fire and, and people that, especially if you're a geologist and, you know, this quest for gold and the way that they purify gold, this process, you know, whether it's called smelting or, you know, when you're purifying a precious metal like that, there's different things they can do. But the ancient process is they'll take like gold that has all these impurities in it or silver or whatever it is. They put it in uh, this, this uh, what's the, a crucible. It's in a crucible. It's superheated. And what happens when they do that? All the impurities that are in that precious metal will start to rise to the top. I believe it's called the dross. All those impurities will start to rise to the top. And then what do they do once those impurities come to the surface? You skim off all the garbage that's on there the process is repeated until it becomes, you know, 99.999% pure or whatever it is. And that's really what happens and what trials, when the Bible talks about our trials that are turned to gold, you know, the things that you go through, it's like God is not putting you through the fire, but the fire that you're going through, the Father will allow things, I really do believe that, because he wants you to mature. If not, why would he allow you to exercise your faith? Why not just go home to heaven and end it all? Right. Because we're in this earth to really live this covenant out, amen? So you do walk through some things. And as a good father, there's times he's going to step back and he's going to watch you fight through 
And he's right there ready. And the Holy Spirit's there to lead you and guide you. And he's made provision. But you're the one that has to exercise your faith and walk it out. So if we're honest with ourselves, whenever we've been through something, when you start to look back and the fire and the presence of God is there and you see all these things start coming up, these character flaws or imperfections or whatever's going on, what is the choice then? Ah, skim that stuff off and your faith becomes more pure. And then the next time you walk through it, it's like, oh, and there might be a little bit of an issue. Well, to the point where you have so much victory in that area that you're just refined like gold. It doesn't even phase you anymore. You, you, you get out behind things and you're like the shield of faith is out there and you recognize them before they even come and you have instant victory over things. Or the fire of God comes, the heat's turned up, all these imperfections and these character things are coming up, but you're afraid of the fire, you get out and what happens? All those things go right back on the inside. And then you walk through it again, you do the same thing and you wonder why you go through the same thing in life over and over and over again, when really it's God trying to refine your character, amen? So you can get to the place where it's just like you just know your covenant so well, your faith is refined, it's like pure gold, amen? And it doesn't even become an issue any longer. Now, correct me after the service. But, I, but from what I understand, and maybe this isn't the ancient process of when he would do that, the way that the refiner would know that the gold was purified is because he would see his reflection. It would become so pure and it would just be this instance when he knew to remove it from the fire that he could see his own reflection in the gold. It's so pure, it's like a mirror looking back at him. The refiner sees his reflection in the gold. That's the definition of grace. The divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. Amen? So, don't despise the fire. Amen? Don't despise the fire and don't despise the process. Because if we see it the right way, listen, that doesn't mean that fire is comfortable. It, it burns some things up. But you have to understand that if you, as the gold that God just chose, that you were so worthy that he chose to send his son to redeem you, you're like precious gold to him. And he just wants to see you refined and pure and holy in his sight. And the fire of God comes and consumes all those things that are not him so that you can walk in, in victory before him every day of your life. Amen? And that's what the refiner does. So don't despise those days that you're walking through some things. See them in the right way. Accept the challenge. Fight the good fight. Amen? One of my favorite stories in Scripture I just love, even as a kid, it was the one I was always fascinated by when I'd hear the Bible story of David and Goliath. Man, to meet David one day, imagine, to be able to just go talk to him about slaying that giant called Goliath. You're going to get to do that, amen? Imagine talking to the Apostle Paul, having a conversation about the Word. You're going to get to do that one day. But, but David, this ruddy youth, this young man, you know, shows up. It's so funny, too, because when he gets to the battlefield, and is, you know, bringing, it, it even says he brought 10 wheels of cheese to his brothers. Like, I love those little details you don't see all the time. I'm like, man, I love cheese, you know? But it <laughs> says he even brought cheese, you know, to them to be able to eat. And he shows up, and then he asks what's going on, because he can see this. It says during that moment that actually Goliath started taunting him when David got there. And it was just a divine thing that happened. So David, you know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here. He's like, what's going on? He's like, well, this Philistine, you know, he's, you know, talking all this trash. And, 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 and they said, the person that can, you know, defeat them, they're going to get the king's daughter. They're going to get all this wealth. And they get to be tax exempt for the rest of their life. Wow. That's basically what he tells him. And David says, now, wait a minute. What did you say? <laughs> he does. Go read the account. And then his brother, you know, well, you're just down here. You want to see all this fight. And he's like, hold on, hold on. And he asked somebody else, now, 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 what was that again? What's going to happen? And all of a sudden, the glory and the provision of that moment and everything, I mean, there is a natural side behind this. We look at one side of it and think, yeah, he was just a, a person of valor and character. Trust me when I say that, that wealth and, you know, the fact that he was going to be taxing up and the king's daughter, who was obviously very beautiful, because he got the king's daughter too. And he's like, wait, wait, wait. And he asked a third time. He's like, interrupt somebody. And he says, 
Now hang on, tell me again what I'm going to get if I do this. So don't tell me there wasn't a natural side behind it as well. But he was a man of the word too. If you look at verse 29, he says this. David said, what have I done now? And answer his brother, is there not a cause? That word literally means there, is there not a word? Standing on the word of God, and, and David knew his covenant. And see, this is the thing. This is such a, it, why I love the story so much, and I know it's not the first time you've heard this, but it's such a beautiful picture of what we deal with in life because you've got all these giants before you, and, you know, understanding that this word that was given, he said, is it not a word? David understood as soon as he heard it, he believed that all this provision was going to be there for him. So he decided to act on the covenant that he knew that he had. And what did he do? It says that he actually ran at the giant. He didn't just, you know, because you ever seen like one of those old Star Trek movies when Captain Kirk's like, dun, 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 dun. He's dancing around, you know, and trying to fight somebody and dodging things. That's not what happened that day. <laughs> and he charged at him. And even before that, he started rehearsing and testifying of the things that God had already done in his life. It's such a beautiful, per perfect picture of the new covenant and how we should respond to the giants that come to us. What did he say? I've killed the lion, I've killed the bear, and here stands before me a man without a covenant. How dare he speak against the God of covenants? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that dares defies the armies of God? 14 years old, ruddy little kid, and he stood up bigger than that army that was there. Amen? ran at the giant with the word of God in his mouth. But there was a payday too. So that's why it's important to understand our covenant and know that he went after it because there was a payday coming as well. Amen? So we have to see it the same way. I've slain the light bill. I've slain the power bill. I've slain the water bill. What is this $50,000 medical bill to me? In the big picture, is it any different? I've slain the headache. I've slain the stomach ache. What is this diagnosis of tumors to me? Amen. Come on, think about it. In the big picture with your covenant and what God has made provision for you, is it any different for him? I know there's a process, and those things can seem intimidating, but it's no different to God. He's made provision for it. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for our covenant and the things that he's made available to us. So I want to read one last chapter here. We're going to jump to, to Psalm 27. Psalm chapter 27. And we're going, to, we're going to put into practice today. I'm very practical when I think about things like this. It gets me in trouble sometimes. Because, I, you know, it's funny. I was telling somebody about this, I think, before the service. I might have been talking to Nate how uh, Pastor Dave and I get along so well and we work together so well, but we're so different. We're so different. I'm not, like, he's more the inspirational, fly off the cuff, the seat of his pants, and makes things work, and I'm the organized, I have to have line by line, precept by precept, and, you know, like, it, it, that, it challenges me to just get out of the box, too, so it's good for me, amen? But I do think practically, and there are some things that, that we can do and, and we're going to put it into practice this morning. Amen. This is actually, absolutely how I saw the Spirit of God doing it. So turn to Psalms chapter 27. And we're going to read this together. If you don't have your Bible, we're going to put it up on the big screen. But I want us to stand. Let's all stand up together. Psalm chapter 27. It's not a very long psalm. But I want us to read it together off the screen and, and just... Now, now, I want you to think about, even if you're not going through something right now, to really make this a confession, but especially if you're dealing with some things right now, and if, and if you're fighting the good fight, and you're walking through something, yeah, I mean, wrap your heart around what this, what this passage is saying, amen? So on three, ready? One, two, three. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. 
Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. Now, pause. We know that in Old Testament times, this is more of an Old Testament principle. Obviously, the Bible says he will never leave us or forsake us. He never turns away because of the new covenant. Amen? So we just got it saved. But let's move on to the next verse. Verse 11. My father, I'm sorry, 10, and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Anybody have your parents forsaken before? Amen. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have arisen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Mm. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. One last verse. This is the last one. Seriously, it really is. This is the last one. I promise. Maybe. Isaiah 54, 17. This is the mindset and the heart of someone and, and, and the resolution that you have to have when things are arrayed against you. But I want, we're going to read it, but I want you to know, notice something before we even do. It does not say that weapons won't be formed against you. Let me, let me say that again. I know some of you know this, but you need to get this in your heart. It does not say weapons won't be formed against you. As a matter of fact, it kind of says that they will. It's a great promise, isn't it? <laughs> but, you ready? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. So this is the heart, and this is what you have to do. We already talked about it earlier. When we glory in certain things, but not for certain things. So this is what it looks like when you glory in something. Because you might be going through some things. I want you to know that I win. 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 I